Well, we'll get started now with our keynote speaker. Uh, Melissa, you can go ahead and, and bring up uh, our very brief introductory slides. As far as logistics, it'll be pretty much similar to what we did in opening up uh, the previous session. We will ask you to actively stay on mute. Uh, Melissa is not always able to get to the mute button and force mute because uh, she is often busy doing other things like screen shares. Um, uh, please keep your view option set to speaker because you're going to have a, a good view of the keynote speakers. And if you encounter any issues, just log back on. So far, so good. And the runtime of this particular session is, is one hour. I would like to turn it over now to Isabelle Leroux, uh, the president of the Alliance Française of Los Angeles. And thank you very much, Isabelle. Vous avez la parole. Merci, Linda. Thank you so much. Uh, for the second time, um, we are 100% online for our annual convention. And next year, if the situation continues to evolve positively, we will be in person in Detroit. We, can, we can't wait for that. The last months have been challenging for the Alliance Francaise, but however, our network is more solid than ever, and together we are even stronger. For this 2021 convention, it's an honor and a privilege to welcome Madame Leila Slimani as the keynote speaker. Thank you so much, Leila. She will be interviewed by Florence Klein, former board member at the Alliance Francaise Los Angeles. Florence was a journalist and anchor for National French TV, She's co-founder, CEO, and host of Startup Vision TV, a media outlet for international startup ecosystem. Leila and Florence, it's your turn. Hello, everyone. So nice to be with you again. Since last year, so many things happened, and we're still here. So that's a, it's a great community, and I'm very honored to, to be hosting uh, uh, this session. And we are welcoming today Leila Slimani. Thank you, Leila, for being with us. Uh, we're very, very proud of you being uh, with us uh, today. Um, brief introduction to show who you are and uh, your great life. So you were born in Rabat, Morocco, and then uh, you came uh, to France to study after Sciences Po and ESCP Business School. Literature became the focal point, point of your career. You published your first novel, Dans le Jardin de l'Ogre, in 2014, and didn't stop since then. You won the most prestigious award for a French writer, Le Prix Goncourt for your novel, Chanson Douce, The Perfect Nanny in the English version. So for all of us, the good news is that you are currently finishing the follow-up of Le Pays des Autres, a novel about the origins of your Franco-Moroccan family, and also a graphic novel, A Main Nue, about the surgeon Suzanne Noel, that will be published very soon. Leila, as I said, it's a great honor to welcome you to the annual convention of the Alliance Française in the US. And it's particularly important for us because since 2017, you've been the personal representative of President Emmanuel Macron for the International Organization of Francophonie. So the first question, of course, that I want to ask you is, what is Francophonie for you? Oh, it's very difficult. Of, first of all, hello to everyone. Um, it's very difficult to uh, give um, a good and a relevant definition of what is francophonie, especially because um, when the president asked me to uh, assume this role of um, representative for the OEF, he said to me, we have to think about this world, francophonie. We have a problem with this world. Um, because this world is also something that in the ears of people living in the post-colonial countries, they have the feeling that francophonie means also the continuum of colonization. It means also France-Afrique. So it has, um, you know, an odeur de souffre. It's not something that is uh, very acceptable by a lot of people. So I thought that maybe we had to redefine this world or to give a new definition to, to this world. But I would say that for me, Francophonie is a, a community, a very large community from all over the world and a community that reunites all the people that love French language, 
whoever they are, whatever their religion, the color of their skin, their gender, and uh, if they speak French very well or not very well and make a lot of, of mistake, we don't care. What we care about is the fact that they love French, that they are interested by French language and by the idea also that French language is not French anymore. French language is African, is Caribbean, is American, is Asian. Uh, French language comes from all over the world. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And and uh, when we see a younger generation turn to English, when their parents spoke French, like in Lebanon, for example, and that is true for many parts of the world, do you think it's because French is not the language of business, for example, or rather the language of emotions? No, I think it's for many reasons. The first reason is that because French was for many, many years the language of the dominance and of the bourgeoisie in those countries. In my country, Morocco, it was exactly like that, like in Lebanon. Uh, French was the, the yeah, the, this this idea of a very arrogant language, the language of the bourgeoisie, of the elite that will dominate. And of course, a lot of people felt that, okay, you don't want me to, you, you dominate me with this language. You don't want me to speak this language. I will speak English. And the truth is a lot of people, and I can understand that, have the feeling that it's easier to learn English. You can learn English through movies and through um, TV shows. And, you know, people, even if you make mistakes in English, they won't look at you with despise. They won't look down on you. Uh, they accept the idea that you won't speak a perfect English. When you don't speak the perfect French in, in France, but also in Morocco or in Lebanon, people will look at you like, oh, you speak. You don't you don't really know how to speak French, so I can completely understand why a, a part of the the youngsters in our countries decided to speak English because for them it's easier and they have the feeling that they will uh, have more opportunities in terms of work, but not only in terms of work, also in terms of of culture, and that they will have access to a culture that is less arrogant than the French culture. So that's why we absolutely need to change the image that people have of French language and to say you have the right to make mistakes. You're not supposed to speak like a prix Nobel or like someone from the Académie Française. And the idea also that French is not just a language to say uh, to poetry or to speak speak in a, a salon littéraire, it's of course a language that you can use for um, doing rap songs or to make uh, people laugh or just to speak in the streets and to find a job, of course. So yeah, I, I really, I understand why young people decide or prefer to learn English. So in fact, you say that uh, uh, the American soft power was uh, much more clever, in fact, than, than the French, because, you know, as you mentioned, uh, the TV shows, uh, the songs and everything worked better, in fact, than, uh, than what French did. But I, I'm not sure it's the American soft power, because, you know, if you speak to a Lebanese or an Algerian, and you ask him why he speaks English and where it comes from. For him, English doesn't belong to anyone. It's not the language of the United States or even of England. It's the language of everyone. Everyone can speak English. It's a sort of globish for them. And they don't speak a very good English. It's this, this globish. So yeah, there is a sort of soft power, but the, the big difference also is that America didn't colonize Africa and didn't colonize Lebanon. So for them also, when they hear French, they hear also a history, they hear a past, they hear a whole history of domination. And we have to deal with that and not to be afraid to confront this history and to confront the past and to confront this inheritance and to say that, no, French doesn't have to, to be this language of domination. It can also be the language of emancipation, the language of freedom, the language of equality, the language of feminism. So that's what we are trying to do today. But I think that if we want to do that, we have also to look at the situation as it is today and at the, the reality. So what could, could we do to enhance the interest in French language and francophone culture to push young people to study French rather than Spanish or Chinese, for example, because it's not, not only with English, it's with other uh, languages also the competition is, I mean. 
I think, first of all, that we have absolutely to forget about this idea of competition. We live in a multilingual uh, uh, world and people are going to learn many languages. And I think that someone who learns English and, and uh, Spanish is even more keen to learn French and to learn Mandarin. The more uh, language you learn and the more human you are. You know, there is a, a proverb in Arabic that says that language are like windows. If you have a lot of windows in the room, the, the, the room is more, that you have more light in the room. So I think that we have absolutely to forget about this idea of competition. Of course, people have to learn English. And if they can, they should learn Spanish too, and Italian and Portuguese and French. So um, I, I really don't like this idea of competition, but I think that we have to uh, embody the, the, this new image of French that I was telling you about. So this idea that French is a modern uh, language, that French is a, a, a language that can be spoken by, by anyone, that you can make mistakes. But also, I think that you cannot uh, only ask French people who are like, uh, you know, French people, old people, very classical to embody that. You have also to, to, to find people coming from IT, coming from Morocco, coming from Senegal, coming from Vietnam, who are also the different faces, the different yeah, figures of the French, the French language. And to tell, you can be who, whoever you want and you can learn and like and love uh, and love French. I think that's the most important. And of of course, we have ourselves to use this uh, this soft power, and this soft power should be, you know, that the, we are very lucky in the francophone world because we have many countries and many cultures. And so, I think that uh, uh, France is not now the center of, uh, of francophony. It should be one country among others, and all those countries should try to work together to build this soft power. Today, we have uh, different media like France 24 or TV5 Monde, but um, since the beginning of my uh, of my mission, I, I really am trying to defend the idea of a French or of a francophone Netflix, a francophone platform where we can show a lot of movies coming from all over the world in French. Yeah, and that's what I like about you. I remember in the conversation, yes, you told me we shouldn't speak anymore about French language and francophonie as a French language. It's about francophone culture, because as you mentioned, you know, it's about writers, it's about singers, and they help, uh, you know, uh, have the French language, in fact, uh, go around the world. And I think it's great. Absolutely. And you know, when I go to China, when I go to Mexico, and people ask me, why should I speak French? I always say to them, it's not because you, you're not going to speak French just to uh, eat croissant and go to the Tour Eiffel. But if you speak French, you will be able to read novels from all over the world. You will be able to understand songs from all over the world and uh, to meet girls or boys and uh, have nice conversation with them from all over the world. So I think also we have to make people conscious of the openness that uh, of the French language can give them. Yeah, and maybe make of the French language, because I can see what you say. It's a very difficult language compared to English, for example, the grammar, um, everything is complicated. And maybe make French more a language of the street, of the people, rather than of the elite, as you mentioned. The truth is that this language already exists, but has no real recognition. And I think that people have this image of the Académie Française, or, you know, it's very difficult to change the French language, but it's not true. The French language is changing all the time. Uh, you know, today, if you look at it, and I have a lot of statistics about it, the French language is the language that um, absorbs the most uh, words from outside. Uh, it's a language that every year in the dictionary, you will find new words coming from Arabic, coming from Asian, from Creole, from English, from Russian. And it's very interesting. And I think that um, in the rest of the world, people don't know that. They they think that we still speak the, the, the same language like in the 18th century, but of course not. We are evolving all the time. And um, I think it's very important also to tell people you can make mistakes. Uh, a language is not sacred. Nothing is sacred. You can, of course, and especially when you write, when you when you sing, 
a, a language is made for it to you can do whatever you want with it and you 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 have to say to people that they can be free they don't have to feel afraid or like in a position of uh, yeah that something is sacred if you make mistake you make mistakes it can, mistake can be very beautiful yeah as you say language is a is a living thing you know uh, yeah exactly yeah, definitely. So, Lele, can you speak about the projects of l'Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie? Oh, alors l'Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie is a multilateral organization where you have like 84 countries. Not all are really members of the, of the organization. Some are associated, some just observe. Um, so countries that are French spoken countries or countries where a lot of people speak, speak French uh, from all over the world, from the five uh, continents. And this organization um, has uh, for uh, objective uh, as, a, as an aim First of all, to be in a space of discussion between those countries, to promote, of course, the the French uh, the French language, but to promote also uh, certain values of uh, democracy, of equality between men and women, of the import importance of uh, education. And um, the majority of the, the programs of the organization are centered around uh, education and culture. And those past years, and I'm very proud of it, there, there is also a focus about women and young girls, especially in, the, in Africa. And during COVID, it was very interesting because they, the people in the organization, they very soon understood that it was going to be a catastrophe for our countries, especially uh, here again in Africa, in the in Caraib and in the South Asia, because uh, because of COVID, a lot of girls uh, quitted school and they are never going to go back to school again. So now we know that we lost like 10, 15 years in terms of education. Uh, that's a catastrophe. That's a real tragedy. So they tried immediately to send iPads, to send uh, also things that uh, uh, gives the possibility to people in little village to have the internet. So girls and little boys also can continue to, to study. So really our focus now is on education. And what is interesting also is that they understood that um, people can't really learn French if they don't learn their own language. Um, in some countries like Benin, like Cameroon, you have more than a hundred languages in one country. Mm -hmm. And when children go to school, usually they learn French because it's easier to learn one language in those countries where you have so much. But when they go back to their, their home, they speak another language. And it's very difficult for them to learn uh, the to learn a language that they don't speak and to speak a language that they don't read. So now we try with um, a lot of researcher and academics to build some dictionaries of those languages that has never been made before. And so to help those people to write the language they speak and to speak the language they write. That's great. It's really uh, uh, great work you're doing. And do, do you feel that all the work done by the Alliance Française around the world, you know, all this passion and energy all those people put into it is positive for francophonie? Uh, would you of have course. Any would of course, and I, I, I would even say that I don't know what we would do without you, because, you know, when I go in all around the world, I always visit an Alliance Française, and very often when you have nothing else, when everyone left, what you have is still an Alliance Française, and people, they stay. Uh, they stay, and they are passionate, and they have, a, yeah, I love the vision they have of the French language, and, you know, even in China, I was in Korea, I was in Mexico, I was in a lot of, uh, of of countries and all, all the time also they knew they know people from Morocco they know people from all other francophone countries and they try also to make people know those those cultures so of course we really need the Alliance Francaise and, and you know now that uh, because I, I always speak as things are, you know, I have no taboo. I know that uh, the French government is going to invest less in the Institut Francais, etc. And of course, we need more and more the Alliance Francaise because people still want to learn French everywhere. You know, in Japan, in Asia, everywhere, I see so many people who want to learn French. And if we don't have the Alliance Francaise, I don't know what we could do. So, of course, and thanks to them. Thank you so much. 
So you're very lucky to be bicultural. The world is now, we talked about it, more and more multicultural. What do you think about this? Is it enhancing cultures? Or on the contrary, will we see some cultural habits or languages fading away? Uh, you know, I think that nothing is black or white. You can never say that something is totally good or totally bad. Um, I'm a novelist and as a novelist, I always try to look at the complexity and the nuance of, of things. Um, my parents didn't really believe in the idea of culture or the idea of nation or the idea of even of belonging. Uh, they hated flags, they hated religion, they hated uh, old tribes and they hated Uh, the, the idea to belong to a group. They were always, okay, try to be just, uh, first of all, an individual and know who you are and have good values. We don't care that uh, your passport is green, red, blue, or whatever, because it doesn't say who you are. And uh, for me, so I, I never defined myself Uh, through this angle. I, I love uh, Morocco because I was raised there and I have so many souvenirs and it's my country, but I'm not the kind of person who would say I'm proud of being this or, um, or I'm lucky to be bicultural. I'm just who I am. And it's like saying I'm proud of having frizzy hair. I just have frizzy hair. It's not good or bad. It's just like it is. So yeah, um, I think that I've earned a lot of things through that because I speak multiple languages, because I've always been in contact with many religion, with many point of views. But at the same time, uh, sometimes I, I feel that I miss something. I would love to really, oh, oh, uh, when I was young, not now, but when I was young, I wanted to belong, to have roots and to, to really be a real Moroccan or real French. You know, when you are a teenager, you always have this kind of desire to, to belong to a group. So yeah, I think it's something, uh, it's something good that we are now all mixing and, but we, I think that it has to go also with the, the recognition of our past and our position in, in the world. I come from two countries, Morocco and France that have a very particular relationship Uh, Morocco was dominated by France for many years and um, people in Morocco suffered a lot of racism uh, from, uh, for many years. And uh, so I think it's important that each part recognize what their failures and they, their fault also maybe. And then we can continue and, and live yeah, with a certain serenity and, and happily. But it's very important to say things and to say the truth. And you mentioned your, your parents and the importance that they had uh, in your upbringing, of course, and uh, giving the personality that, that you have. Do you think parents should be the one to do a sort of transmission of culture and language or should it be done at school or both, of course? Um, no, I think that, of course, parents, if they, if they want to, they, they should do it. Uh, the, the thing is that we do it even if we don't recognize it just by the fact that we speak a language and the language we speak will be transmitted to the child by the fact that we will tell him stories, that we will tell him or tell her souvenirs and things that we live, that we have a certain point of view on, on things that is probably influenced by the culture we, we come from. And, um, you know, for, for many years, I was very angry against my, my parents because they didn't give me, gave me this very sense of tradition, of culture, and I wanted that. So, yes, I think that today maybe I try to, to do that more with my, my children, not to give them like a, a absurd sense of pride, but just to tell them where I come from and how was the color of the sky and how was the taste of what I ate when I was their age and what it was to, to sleep on, on the beach on the, on the weekend with my mother in, in the winter, just sensation, emotion. I think that culture is emotion. It's not an ideology. It's not saying it's like this or it's like that. It's an emotion. It's a, it's a color, it's taste on your, on your mouth it's um yeah it's a, an old souvenir that you you, you keep with uh, with yourself is the feeling that you're not completely alone that other people uh, share this uh, this with you so yeah i think that i try to transmit those emotions to my my children 
Yeah, that's beautiful what you say because it's exactly it, you know, it should be an emotion. Um, have we lost uh, perhaps uh, Florence? Florence, are you still there? Florence? Florence? Yeah. yeah. Did you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can hear you. Uh, for, for a moment there, you were gone. And, and yeah, you're I'm, 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 I'm so you're sorry. Not... I had a, a little problem, or, um, hmm. a little, uh, or <laughs> I don't know what happened. So well, Lily, you're, uh, you're back. Thank you. I'm back. I'm back with you all. Uh, now I would like to, to speak to you about you and literature. You are a very successful author. People like your prism about life. So is writing for you like an emotion? And we talked a lot about emotion. Or is it some sort of transmission or maybe something else? Can, can you tell us about it? Oh, what is literature for me? It's uh, at the same time very mysterious and... Uh... And very clear, it's the, the, the center of, of my life. It's my obsession is the thing I, I love the most, but not only as a writer, as a, as a reader, I think first. When I was a child, I was a, a crazy reader, reading all the time and not only reading all the time, but being really obsessed by what I was reading. And when I was reading a book from Russia or from China or from the US, I, I was sure that I was American or that I was Russian or that I was Chinese. I, I, I could become really the character of the, uh, of the book. It was a fusion, something really crazy. And uh, I think that literature taught me everything about life. And the way I look at the world, the way I look at people is completely influenced by that. Um, I'm very touched by everything. Everything that happens around me touched me and sometimes makes me so, so sad and, uh, uh, yeah, overwhelm me because I, I look at everything through literature. I try to see behind the mask, behind the appearances, behind all the small talks that we have, and I try to see what people are hiding what are their secrets? What are their sorrows? And um, yeah, I think that literature is everything for me and uh, I couldn't imagine a life without it. Yeah, I, I heard you say this anecdote, which I loved and, and you're mentioning this right now, you know, I think it was, um, you were reading Anna Karenin and uh, uh, your mother told you to come and have dinner and then you couldn't believe that she was asking you that because she, Anna Karenin had just died. It was like. Yeah, and I was very angry against my yes. mother. She asked me to have dinner because Anna Karenin was, was dead. And you know, Anna Karenin is probably one of the most important person of my life. She's one of my best friends. And she, she was very important for me. And my mother couldn't understand that something really, really, really tragic has happened in my life and I said to her I won't come to dinner Anna Karenin is dead and so then my mother said oh, okay she's crazy and you know at that at that time I was wearing Russian clothes and I was living in Morocco and I would go to school with a, a shapka in fur and with a, a coat and it was very hot of course in, in Morocco and I would sweat all the time but I was like I want to be a Russian and my mother said okay if you want to be an Karenin, okay you can go to school like that everyone was making fun of me but I didn't care because I was with with Anna. So ladies and gentlemen we just met the real Lila Slimani. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so tell us, how, how do you write? Are you very disciplined with specific hours dedicated to, to, to writing or is it more based on an inspirational moment? Oh, it doesn't exist, inspirational moments. I don't think that any writer who makes writing uh, his life can say that he writes on inspirational moment because inspiration is nothing more than work. Um, you don't have inspiration and you you sit and something comes. No, you have to sit every day, every day, every day, every day. And then you know how to use the little inspiration you have and to make something of it. But inspiration is, is nothing without work. So yes, I'm very disciplined because I, I work all the time. But the way I, I work is not very um, usual. 
Um, I don't have a plan. I don't have a structure. I have books everywhere. I have little notes everywhere. It's a, it's a real mess. And uh, when I write a book, I begin by the end and then I write the middle. And, uh, and my publisher, he really doesn't understand how I do this. He said that I'm driving him crazy. But I did, at the end, I don't know how, but it's a book. And it has a structure and it has a, a, a logic. But uh, yeah, there is something very mysterious in the act of, of writing. It has to do with focusing very much. I can be very, very focused. And uh, when I write, I forget about everything. I don't go out. I don't answer my phone. I don't answer my emails. Um, I barely spoke, speak with my family. I'm obsessed with what I'm working on and I'm obsessed with my characters. I only think about that. You have to be very, very selfish when you write. And so I'm very selfish and I only think of that. So I can wake up in the middle of the night and, and write. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a mess. I have uh, little notes on my, on my iPhone and notes on, on everything. I just think about that. And at the end, you you like in a trance you're with them and then you read what you wrote and you're like wow where does it come from you don't know you don't know where does it come from but it arrives so this is really inspiration when i was talking about that you know it's all about no i think it's concentration it's uh, focusing it's not really inspiration uh, i think it's the fact of being seated for 12 hours in the same room on the same chair without doing anything else um, so it, it's not really for me, it's not inspiration. It's really focusing so much that nothing else exists beside what you are doing. So women's rights are very important for you. Women always have important roles in your books. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, I've always been fascinated by, by women all my life since I was a, a young girl. I was raised in a family of women. Uh, with my grandmother, who was a very independent and very funny woman, with my mother, who was uh, someone I admired very much all my life. I have two sisters. I had an, uh, an aunt that was my babysitter nanny. She would take care of me all the time when I was uh, when I was young, and she was the first woman in Morocco, in, in Rabat, in my my town, who was a divorcee, and she she used to live alone. She had a car that she drove by herself, and she had a little shop in the center of Rabat. And she would put me in the, the vitrine, you know, of the shop when I was a child. So people would say, oh, she's nice. She would, they would enter in the, in the shop. So it's not very feminist, but I spent all my weekends in, in the vitrine of a, of, a, of a shop. So, yeah, I was fascinated by women. You know, I remember that when I was a child and we were watching movies, especially Westerns, and everyone was like, wow, the cowboy, the, the Indians. And the only thing that would interest me was the woman seated in the saloon, you know, at the bar and uh, alone and no one is looking at her. And I was sure that she had so many secrets and that her life was probably crazy and very interesting. How, how she arrived here, what happened to her, who, who is this, her family, where are they? And um, yeah, I was always interested by, by women. I found them so beautiful and so secretive. And so um, they had so much dignity because I, I knew so many women in my family who suffered very much, but I was always smiling and laughing and being beautiful and they wear makeup and I remember some of them that was bitten by their husbands and they would have bruises and they put makeup and when I was a child I thought that people invented makeup to um, to to give the possibility to women to hide the the fact that people would would bite them so yeah I know that they had so many stories to tell and no one was listening to them and uh, yeah, I, I, I knew that all my life I was, I was going to try to tell those stories. So that's very touching what you say. And uh, we understand, you know, it's so deep and so important. Thank you. Uh, who are the writers who inspire you? Oh, there are so many. Um, I would say that... My the most important writers for me I, are the Russian writers because they really they overwhelm me. They 
I think that they are the, the masters, they are the, the biggest, the better one. So, of course, Dostoevsky, uh, Chekhov, uh, Anna Akhmatova, uh, Solyanichin, but also um, a Russian woman called Ludmila Ulitskaya or the Belarus uh, Svetlana Alexievich, who is uh, still alive and uh, who I admire very much. Um, a, a lot of American writers also. Um, Faulkner was very important for me. Flannery O'Connor was very important for me. Uh, James Baldwin, uh, Carson McCullers. Um, I love also writers from um, South America, like uh, Clarice Spector or George Amadou, um, all the realism magic, so Garcia Marquez and Carlos Fuentes. Um, a lot, a lot of writers. You know, I, I'm the kind of writer who is crazy about writers. I'm still fascinated by by them, and um, so it would be difficult for me to give you the whole list of the writers that are important for me. And how, how does it feel when you receive the a prestigious prize like Prix Goncourt? How do, how do you feel? I mean, this is incredible. Oh, it feels awkward, very awkward, and. Uh, You know, at the same time, it's really nice. So you try to enjoy it and be happy with it. But uh, I think that a writer should never should never have to, to deal with success. Success is very bad for a writer. It's very dangerous. Um, success is a poison. And you think it exists, but it doesn't. It has no taste. It has no smell. It's nothing success. It's just, it's an abstraction. So it's very important to stay pure and not to be corrupted because what you are all your life, when you are a writer, you have to use your soul and to use your heart. And if your heart is corrupted, you can't write anymore. So I'm very, yeah, I think that I try to enjoy, but I always have some distance with that. I, I don't like the idea of being successful because Success is unfair and failure is unfair. It's always unfair. Why does a, a book work and another one doesn't work? And um, it's not my, my problem. My problem is to write. It's not to, to deal with what's happening next. Cold head and Leila. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for answering uh, all those questions. Thank you so much. And I, I'm, I'm will uh, go to Isabel now that might have some questions from uh, uh, people. Uh, yes, in the chat. Florence, there is a, a question from Mo Omari from IF uh, Detroit. We will be with you, Mo, next year. <laughs> Regarding the chat, yes, the Nobel, Pri the Nobel Committee just announced the Nobel Prize of Literature to uh, the African born Tanzanian Abdul Razak Gona. Do you think we are close to seeing a Maghrebian North uh, African writer getting that recognition? recognition? Why not? Of course. Um, and, uh, you know, I would be, yeah, I would be very happy of it. But the, the thing is that um, the, the Maghreb, the, the, what we call the Maghreb, so Algeria, Tunisia and, and, and uh, Morocco don't uh, have the same tradition of uh, literature than we have in, in the West. The, the novel is... Um, quite a recent form for those, those writers. Uh, it began like in the, the 40s, 50s. Uh, so I, I'm not sure that people in the, in the committee of the, of the Nobel are very, are very aware of what people are doing there. Um, we had uh, uh, Nagib Mahfouz, the Egyptian who won the, the, the Nobel Prize, and it was very important for the, for the Arab people. And I'm very, very happy that it's a Tanzanian today because I think personally, that Africa is probably the future of literature. One of the best writers today are Africans. Okay. Do we have another question, Isabel, or do... do no, we are fine. No. And we know that um, uh, yes. Leila yes. has to switch <laughs> to another you. Zoom with the French government. So yeah. thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Me thank now. you. <laughs> I can see. Thank I you for this you. very inspiring discussion. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so, so much. So close to the